Hey everybody, thanks for joining me again on JRL Golf Academy. In this episode of JRL Golf Academy, I had the pleasure of interviewing none other than PGA's Teacher of the Year, Scott Cox. Scott Cox is a master at developing patterns uh, within the golf swing, also within the short game. So I hope you enjoy this episode of JRL Golf Academy. How's everybody doing? There he is. Oh my God, sunlight. Yeah, it does. It does sometimes shine in Canada. Oh my goodness! I Not thought that was. I thought that was just an urban myth. Yeah, we don't actually uh, drive a sled, you know, past uh, you know, kind of uh, marked anyway. <laughs> I love it. I love it. How you doing, my friend? You do good. You guys doing okay up there? Yeah, everything's still on lockdown. You know, it's, it, I think we're gonna have another. Uh, you know, I think last bet they said probably another month or two of this, so we'll see. Okay. I got how, about you. You guys, how about you guys in LA? 72 degrees with a slight breeze today. Uh, that'll work. It's it's actually pretty nice here. It's probably almost uh, 60, so. Okay. That is nice that's up like, there. That's like summertime weather for me. <laughs> you, hey, make sure you put sunblock on today. <laughs> I know. I'm going to get a little shine there going. It'll, it'll be good. Yeah, that's all right, man. I just got done with a uh, – I was doing some online lessons and stuff like that, so. It's kind of cool. Yeah. I'm just wearing this in board shorts. We yeah, got the, we... uh, it's, uh, it's a good way to uh, promote your sponsors there, bud. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I like the hat. I like the hat. It's good. Oh, I appreciate it. Next day you come down, I'll give it. Uh, I'll send you one. I'll give yeah. you one here. So, yeah. We gotta... uh, how is it? Um, am I coming in clear there to you? Yeah, you're pretty good. Am I uh, okay or? Yeah, you're 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 good, man. You're good. Hey, what's going on, Oscar? All right, we, yeah. we've got people rolling in here. Missed that SoCal. He, do you know Eric Wang? Um, up the, uh, my buddy Eric Wang. No, I know the name. Don't know him. Don't know. All right, Eric, you need to go see Scotty. He's in uh, Victoria, I believe he is. Eric is. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's got to go. Uh, Eric, you need to go do that. Yes, we hear you guys um, fine. Excellent. Uh, I'm glad. Uh, Supposed to do a uh, certification out there in the uh, probably late summer. I'm going to be in Vancouver with uh, my buddy uh, Matt Paulsenberg. At uh, you remember Matt who was there? At yeah. The, uh, um, so at his club, I think I'm going to come out to uh, Point Grey um, at that time. So hopefully we can okay. meet up, uh, Eric. That'll be fun. Excellent, excellent. All right, so we'll get started here. We'll I'll just do a little housekeeping. Appreciate you guys tuning in here live with Larry. I got our our star, our star guest here, Canada's PGA Teacher of the Year, none other than Scott Cox. So uh, thank you, Scott, for being on here. Hey, you know, anything for you, buddy. I mean, it, we always have a good time when I'm down in L.A., and uh, this time was no different. So, uh, I mean, I think the first time was the, uh, was the In-N-Out Burger uh, with that's, Austin. Uh, that's right. What was it? <laughs> uh, what was it called? Uh, animal Style or something? Or Animal Style Double Double. That's right. I even got a picture of Scott taking his very first bite because I wanted to commemorate the actual time that he took his first In-N-Out Burger bite. So that, that yeah, was a special time. I'll pay you not to release that photo. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, so tell us, um, tell some of the viewers in here. Obviously, we've got uh, a lot of viewers that are very interested in hearing from you. Um, can you tell people what you've been up to in terms of the Scott Calc Certified? Uh, sure. I mean, basically, uh, about four, a little over four years ago, I guess I got a, uh, I got a text, I got a, a message, um, a messenger from uh, Kenneth Hansen in Denmark, and uh, he and uh, another Danish pro, uh, Rasmus uh, Rolligeg, um got in touch with me, asked me if I, I'd want to come over to Denmark and present some of my ideas. And at the time, all that, all those ideas and everything were kind of swirling around in the head and everything else, but really not on paper. So it kind of forced me to get it down on paper and, and create sort of this presentation. And uh, I'm sure if I look back at that first, uh, that first one I did, it's probably a little rough, but uh, it was good. They, they've had me back a couple of times since then. And, and that sort of uh, grew into um, sort of an annual thing twice a year to go to Europe and uh, you know, in the last couple of seasons. So uh, from there, sort of branch out in the U.S. Uh, you know, Oscar uh, hosted us obviously yeah. last year and Tanya at Brentwood this year uh, yeah. in L.A. But, um, you know, Dennis Sales, uh, Jason Sutton in uh, Charlotte, you know, a bunch of other guys have yeah. hosted. 
um, Sean Webb down in uh, Shreveport, Paxton, Claybaugh, and uh, and um, uh, also in Louisiana. So, yeah, it's been it's it wasn't really a business plan or anything. It just kind of evolved into into this uh, um, sort of a, a subset to my business, and I, I found I really enjoyed it. I, I think it's in the blood. My my father was a school teacher. My sister's a school teacher. Um, so I think I enjoy teaching and, and uh, only as for something that I like. And, and obviously uh, that's, that's nice with the golf swing. So it's fun to talk shop and talk mechanics and talk sort of deep dive stuff uh, with other pros. And, and obviously uh, we've had lots of conversations, you and I, but yeah. um, um, a lot of fun. And, and uh, so I'm very fortunate um, to, to sort of, to do that and that's sort of evolved the last year or so into a little bit more of a consulting role where um you know uh, coaches across the world i'll help them with some of their players some of their swings either in person or online um and, and really i you know i have a table full of, of of students myself it's not like i'm looking for other students or to try and, and sort of lure students away from other coaches yeah. or anything i'd rather work with the coaches themselves and and with their students and, and maybe present some different uh you know second opinion if you will and and that's been very successful as well so i was on a call uh, a couple of calls earlier this morning uh, to a couple of coaches um doing that very same thing so basically they'd send me a couple of uh of videos of their students they wanted to work on or maybe their own swing or uh and we sort of discuss that for an hour or so and Obviously, with the uh, the times that we have right now, it's that's become sort of the uh, the business model at the moment. Absolutely, you're great at collabing uh, with other. Really, that's what your your business has become. You, you you collaborate with a lot of other teachers, and at the end of the day, I think as a teacher myself, it's nice to have somebody like yourself right behind me, going, "Hey, you know, is, does that look okay? Is that is that all right with you?" And you know, it gives us confidence in continuing to go down certain rivers you know, that we do go down with players. Well, I, I find, to be honest with you, I, I think that, um, you know, today's today's coaches in general are, are, are generally quite informed. And, and uh, the problem sometimes is that they kind of get led down, you know, kind of the Alice in Wonderland hole, if you will. And, and sometimes they look at maybe swings only in one way. And I think yeah. that's a danger of all that, that every coach, I mean, so I certainly fell into that myself at times where you kind of want to put everybody into the same sort of box and, and, uh, Sort of have them either do it the same way or, or sort of look at the same the swings the same way, and I think that's dangerous. I mean, there's so many cool ways of teaching golf, uh, whether it's you know mechanics, dynamics, visual, auditory, you know drills, whatever you're going to try and do to get your point across. And um, sometimes I think it's just when when a coach kind of gets stuck, it's it's not that the message is any different. It's it's kind of like, well, how do I get this message across to this person who may or may not uh, I may may or not may not be communicating the point particularly well and um so that's kind of where that's evolved is you know here's a drill that's, that's worked for me here's here's something i saw in europe this is how they do it there you know um some of those things so it's been cool to sort of amalgamate some of the techniques both in coaching as well as um you know let's say technique and mechanics yeah uh, from, from all over the world from all over the world that's like uh when we go through the uh the 10 levels of softness kind of stuff in the short game. And, and, uh, yeah. you know, some of those cool shots that uh, I've been privileged to learn have, have come from certainly other sources. I, I, I recall when you were here in LA and you were talking about the, the 10 level of softness and you basically said after seven, eight, nine and 10, he goes, your, yeah. your, your issue isn't the softness, it's your course management. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, th I think it's really around level four, level five. Once you get by level four, level five softener, you need to slap yourself upside the head because it's <laughs> awful. And, yeah. uh, you need to really learn how to, uh, how to manage your way around the golf course, for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, let me ask you this. Um, yeah. How has uh, teaching evolved, or do you feel – how much has teaching changed over the last 10 years in your eyes? Well, immensely, I would say With this. Technology. I mean, yeah, I, I think technology has been great. I think it's, it's more that the application of the technology and that's where, you know, all of us as, as instructors, I think are required to be educated in, in some manner to, uh, or let's say continuing education to sort of stay up with some of the things because, it's not that it necessarily disproves what you taught before or really changes necessarily your message or even how you would necessarily teach it to a player. 
but having that little bit of deeper understanding of what what's actually going on i think is is very powerful um you know track man and, and some of the, the sensor stuff uh, like hack motion and so on are very powerful tools if you know how to use them uh, uh really well um i would say that the phds that we all sort of listen to dr kwan dr Sasha mckenzie you know dr nesbitt etc they're, they're all great um sort of uh, sources of information, but at the same time, we ourselves have to be able to take some of that information and, and either apply it or or not apply it. And, and that's that's sort of the challenge is it's difficult to jump in with two feet uh, because yeah. not everyone has that sort of level of um, intrinsic knowledge very readily, you know, especially if you're shattering some beliefs that they already have. Yeah, I got you. Um, let's take time right here, Scott. Guys uh, and girls, Please feel free to ask some questions that you want us to go over. Uh, Scott's been kind enough to um, uh, spend some time here, obviously, but he also wants to answer questions that you guys may have. Um, he's a master, obviously, at uh, the Hack Motion. You, you're, you're developing actually a um, a program for Hack Motion, or how's that working out with Hack Motion right now? Yeah. So basically, uh, one of one of the one of the things I'm doing right now is is sort of writing their uh, the hack motion certification, which will just basically go through kind of identifying the patterns, how to use the device, uh, in, you know, in different forms, perhaps different, uh, even some different drills or different ideas on how to solve some of the common faults that we see at the wrist level. Um, and they've been kind enough to sort of put their trust in me to develop that. So we're a little bit behind with that, obviously, with all the things going on in the world right now. But I hope to have some of that stuff out in the next uh, month or so. Okay. All right. Um, one of those uh, patterns or uh, with hack motion that you really got into uh, last time that I saw you here was this thing called the Cobra pattern. Um, huh. Is there anything you could talk about the Cobra pattern a little bit? Well, Cobra pattern just, just sort of, you know, evolved. There's, there's actually two sort of Cobra pattern references. You will and, and uh, number one was was basically the the wrist moving from uh, sort of flexion state uh, in the downswing toward extension. Okay, so that type of a release pattern, what we call a cobra pattern, has less what we call axial rotation around the shaft. So we're okay. basically squaring up the entire golf club like a, like a cricket bat like this um, because that wrist is moving more from flexion toward extension. Now, generally, okay. it's not extension and impact, but it's moving toward extension. So the okay. speed of the club is being moved toward that extension. Um, you know, in a traditional sort of uh, old school type release or what we call your, your sort of constant flexion toward, I'm sorry, your constant uh, extension toward flexion model, like a Tommy Fleetwood or, or something like that, who's almost got this little bit of a turn down or a yeah. sort of uh, TGM style release where you're actually increasing the amount of, of flexion as we come on down. And so basically the, the wrists are very quiet, very quiet, very quiet. As they approach impact, they actually go toward flexion, whereas the Cobra pattern is going from flexion toward extension. So it's very important that we know the difference because, you know, that totally changes both the ball flight, both what their miss pattern will be, uh, and most importantly, where that club face vector is actually moving around uh in that impact interval so you know what we see is a lot of the the modern players if you will that smash the ball very high very straight are generally moving toward this sort of cobra model where it's a little bit more inflection a little bit more toward the extension model the challenge for that for the average player though is is they can't move their bodies fast enough to deal with right. that pattern right um so it's it's some trade-offs there and it's not like it's certainly not that Tommy Fleetwood doesn't hit great golf shots, obviously. So, you know, both patterns can work. Uh, those are the main two patterns that we see, but we have to understand which one of those we're, we're using if we're going to really be uh, diligent with understanding what that player's misses are going to look like and, and so on. So one of the things you'll see is, is generally push drawers of the golf ball. You're going to see more of this old school release where this is a little bit more driving toward flexion. Okay. Having to having the speed move around the shaft a little bit more. Okay. Uh, whereas the Cobra pattern, uh, generally you'll see a lot of players hit little cuts, straight ball cuts and things like that. Uh, sort of your modern Colin Morikawa and, and uh, DJ and, and uh, Kepka and those types of players generally favor a little bit of a cut pattern. Gotcha. 
maybe like a Victor Hovland as well. Yeah, Victor is like the original Cobra for sure. And, and sorry, to, that was the other thing is the Cobra pattern is simply, you know, we're talking about how to wind up this trail arm a little differently because we've got the upper arm actually in external rotation, but the lower arm actually in supination. Uh, or sorry, pronation this way. So, yeah. you know, that's the Cobra itself. So at the top of the backswing, we're a little bit more kind of like holding an umbrella up and up like this as opposed to a traditional sort of placement up here. So we kind of get this Cobra pattern this way. As we go ahead and rotate, that pushes the wrist into ulnar, allows me to rotate faster and do some interesting things there. Now, is that something that you probably would use more with a younger player uh, that has a lot of speed, um, not necessarily an older player that just doesn't have the rotational speeds? Yeah, I, I definitely fit it, fit it that way for sure. I mean, generally, if you've got a player that's, that can't move their body very quickly, can't rotate, has less than usually 45 degrees of thoracic to pelvic uh, sort of rotational uh, separation, um, I'm not going to use Cobra with that player because as soon as they go ahead and rotate, everything's going to get pulled out too far. Yeah. yeah. Right? Whereas a player, you know, they might be better off with a little bit more of the Tommy Fleetwood sort of push-draw type release pattern. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Here's a question from CSW Golf. How do you, how do you keep a player's characteristics while still improving them technically, and also guiding them towards a certain swing when there are so many different ways to play well? Yeah, great question. I mean, I think that uh, you know, as a as a coach, especially if you're dealing with good players, you got to be absolutely minimalistic as possible. Yeah. Uh, because if they're playing any kind of a tour game where their their livelihood is dependent on how well they play every day, um, you know, you better not make wholesale changes that's going to ruin them. So, you know, you have to be, I mean, the secret to being a tour coach is, is you know, don't uh, um, try and make changes that they don't know about, you know, if you can. You know, try not to make them look funny, feel funny, because they're not going to commit to that. So the secret yeah. is, and even better, if you're really good, um, you know, try and make it their idea. <laughs> Sounds like a marriage. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's it's a little bit more tenuous when you're working with tour players, for sure. Yeah, yeah. That that's a great, great uh, point there. Here's a, a good question that I think a lot of people often ask: What role do the arms play in early transition? Well, it depends a little bit on the pattern, uh, really. But you know, if if we can, if I mean, the biggest thing for most players to understand is everything that you do, at least if you're a decent player, is depending on what you do with the club face. So if that face gets open, you're generally going to see players have more pull down in early transition, okay? Because they're using that apparatus to help them square the face up. Okay. If a player is in a little bit more flexion, already sort of preloaded with that face, generally then we can kind of keep our arms up and rotate and, you know, try not to let out the arms as quickly. And that might be a benefit um, you know, from both a power perspective, but also a control perspective. Um, the issue with pulling down on the club is that as soon as I start to get this club going and these arms start to race past my body, I start losing these important things like dorsiflexion and trail wrist and, and trail elbow. Then now I've got no club face, to, you know, consistency. I hate to use the word stability because obviously it's not yeah. stable, but um, yeah. <clears throat> basically – each one of us to hit the ball straight has a certain amount of dorsiflexion, a certain amount of trail arm bend that we need at impact and um, that fits our grip and our style of playing, et cetera. So if I'm whipping these arms down in front of me and pulling them down, I think it's a dangerous go. Uh, having said that, there's obviously good players that can do it. Yeah. Uh, but obviously uh, sometimes there's some, some correction needed around the golf ball that I personally don't really like. Yeah. Yeah. And these are just, these are just Scott's preferences. You know what I mean? As Scott's saying, he goes, um, some people do it and some people don't. Right. Uh, let's see here. Scott, yeah, what's Nate? Yep. Too, is, is we all have, like it or not, we all have preferences on what we like to yeah. see as coaches. Uh, you know, the challenge I find for myself as, as well as everybody else is try and look past your preferences sometimes and, and sort of figure out the player's preferences and, I learned that lesson quite well working with Eduardo uh, Molinari a few years ago. And, um, you know, it's not what I gave him was incorrect or anything like that. And it worked very, very well, but it didn't quite fit his sort of, sort of feel. So in the end, we had sort of a 2.0 version that we went with that was a little bit different model um, because 
what I should have done from day one was sort of adhere to his preferences and have some better conversation uh, at the get go. Now, having said that, he also, when he reached out to me to get to do some work, he wanted my sort of opinion on which direction to go. So it kind of goes both ways a little bit with tour players. Gotcha. Uh, that's an interesting point there. Would you find that um, with with that instance, that was obviously with a tour player, How how is that conversation with your bread and you know bread and butter uh, student with a lot of the teachers here the the 15 handicapper that comes up do you just basically go no you're going to do it this way or is it do you go down that same conversation route yeah a little bit i mean if they're a good player you know let's say five handicap or better you might bridge that conversation i mean if they're over a five handicap they really have no idea what a good swing feels like yeah they really don't know what a good golf shot feels like so it's up to us sort of to lead them a little bit into this and you know they're coming to you looking for um you know, obviously a better way yeah. of getting things done. And yeah. uh, so they're also less, let's face it, they're less um, coordinated to be able to, um, you know, a tour player, you can kind of tell them to swing anyway, they're going to figure out a way to hit the ball. Um, yeah. But you're 10 hand above, obviously there's going to be ways that are easier for them and ways that are more difficult. Yeah. I just thought gotcha. question on uh, constant radius under load. Is it the yeah. same? As, um or sorry, is it the same as a constant radius? And basically those two models are similar, basically centered pivots, a fairly constant radius of the trail arm toward the body coming through impact uh, from sort of P5, P6 to P8. Um, we can underload it, which I think with today's golf ball is beneficial to be able to launch it higher with less spin. Um, but in the old days, you could go constant radius with a ton of radial uh, you're just going to create a little bit more spin with that type of emotion. Now, why would you say in your in your way, why would you say the underloading would necessarily create a higher ball flight? Uh, just because you, basically the width of arc at the bottom is going to be wider. You're going to, you know, generally you're going to have a little bit shallower approach to the golf ball. So as a yep. result, you're going to see a little bit more dynamic loft. So I guess the, the, where we would see uh, that. Angle we're attacks is just not quite as steep. Okay. So if we saw that, like an example of players like a Steve Stricker was a, is, a, is a big time underloader versus a, a Sergio. Uh, yeah, you I mean, obviously they can still yeah. hit the ball high and do anything they want at yeah. that level. But, the, you know, they're, they're actually sort of, they're varying up their release pattern a little bit to be able to do that. Um, yeah. You know, they might even hang back like Sergio. Anytime he wants to hit it high, he just kind of leans back a little bit more and and obviously applies a little bit more loft to it. But in general, you'll find, you know, with that shallowness, it's a little easier to create that sort of up and out uh, swing direction on the driver being a little bit underloaded. Yeah, I found that helped me out a lot too, Scott, when you showed me that. Um, well, Scott, what's the first thing you look at in a new student swing ball flight from Mark Milley? Um, I, again, it kind of depends, again, on the level, but you know, if, if they're a good player, um, generally we're going to have a conversation about that because good players, it's usually not the ball flight they want. It's getting rid of the ball flight they don't want. So, yeah. you know, a lot of times we're tailoring the, the instruction around that. Um, most good players obviously don't like to hook it. So some guys want to build fades into their swing or, or whatever happens to be. And, and that's okay. And if, if that's the direction they want to go, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to play any better. But for them, a lot of it's sort of confidence related where, if they can eliminate that shot the majority of the time, they feel like they can go out there and be a bit more aggressive and, and uh, play a little, little bit more uh, fearlessly. Gotcha. Good, good point there. Um, Tom Duncan Golf asks, hi, Scott. Do you have a grip preference in relation to face control? Thanks. Well, that's, that's, that's a very difficult question to answer. Um, you know, it just depends, again, a little bit on what the pattern the player is looking for. Uh, generally, if I have a stronger grip toward more flexion, that player is going to generally have more um, trail arm bend and, and more dorsiflexion and impact. That generally reduces the amount of axial sort of rotation I can put along the shaft. The more my club gets out in front of me and I shoot that trail arm, the faster the uh, sort of about the shaft um, torque can be applied. So from a muscular standpoint, I'd love love to see every player hit with a little bit of dorsiflexion, a little bit of uh, trail arm bend, but a lot of players can't get the side bend and rotation amounts to be able to support that. 
So, yeah, you know, we're, we're sort of dealing with anatomy all the time and what can a player do and, and what a player can't do. Okay. Let's Mike see Beaumont. Uh, we've got a Michael question wants here. To know if I, yeah. yeah, Michael Beaumont wants to know if I, I want to modify the uh, Cobra pattern for the short game. And I'm a big believer that you need at least two grips in golf, if not three. Um, you know, you need a short game grip, you need a full swing grip, and generally you need some uh, sort of special shot grips as well, like the Yo Ishikawa, uh, you know, split hand stuff, yeah. and some of the other options that you could have. So uh, I would certainly wouldn't do Cobra in the uh, short game because I think you'll get too much lead edge, too much digging action, not enough bounce. Um, so generally we're going to see wrist option B, a little bit more supination, a little bit more radial deviation, a little bit more extension that lead wrist to be able to uh, expose a little bit more bounce to the uh, to the ground. All right. Uh, Paragraphs here, puck release. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what is a puck release or what's the yeah. question? Yeah. You just said puck release. I don't know what that, I don't know what so that meant. Puck release is. Puck release is a, a term that they use at Ledbetter uh, to describe sort of a, a wrist pattern that is moving a little bit toward extension. Uh, this okay. way, so they teach a lot of players to release it, uh, pressure into the left heel, and go ahead and, and sort of extend that wrist a little bit, um, somewhat as an anti-left type of a motion. Um, so you could call it a puck release, but I, I would call it more with the pattern being the flexion in that wrist because the speed – of how I release that's going to determine some height as well as club head speed issues. Um, some players obviously can get excessive with their flexion. Um, some players less so. So the amounts do matter as well. I think in the golfing machine, they call that the paw release, I believe. Uh, yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll have to go back and look at Greg's presentation from yesterday and get <laughs> pulled up on my uh, golf machine again. That was like pretty that. cool to have the, the OG. Yeah, I like Greg's uh, explanation with the three clubs on the ground that uh, you posted today. That was good. Yeah, he, he did. A, he, he, I love having him around. He, he's the OG of the golfing machine. Uh, Phil Cornet Golf, what are three key fundamentals that you feel are essential? Well, you know, there's there's really the most important one, certainly where you hit the ground, okay, or controlling your low point. Uh, with yeah. the world class players I've worked with, that low point number, you know, shot to shot on a stock shot, it's not changing by more than about half an inch. Um, so I'd say that's the number one fundamental because that's setting up your quote, quote, face control shot after shot. So if you can keep that low point very, very, very tight, your club face is going to look very stiff every single time. And since club face is roughly 75 to 85 percent your start direction, uh, I would say the low point first would give us some face control, also gives us our path, because combined with the uh, you know the swing direction and that low point, getting that angle of attack and, and ultimately the path out of that number. So um, low point first, that's going to set up the timing of the face. That would be second. Uh, now, how I achieve that fundamentally is going to be, uh, that's another story. So, Okay. Yeah, it's, it is another story there. Sure. Um, golf's about... Uh, death grip or talk death grip. Why does it make swings look so good and why it makes contact flight so pure? Sorry, death gripping the club makes it good? Yeah, I think he's probably talking about a really super strong grip is my guess. Oh, and, okay. Like a four, uh, four knuckle grip or something. Yeah, um, generally, you know, yeah. most players, I mean, basically the way the wrists work is the more you push a wrist toward radial, deviation it wants to move into extension okay so if i start with my wrist in extension with a very very strong grip here that generally will allow me to cock this radially much further than if i don't go into extension so for some players that might feel very powerful uh generally creates uh, a much more negative angle of attack which you know feels awfully nice when you're smashing eight irons but doesn't work so well when you're trying to hit three irons up in the air yeah yeah Maybe he was also talking about like how you were talking about the face getting a little stronger at the top that, you know, there's, there's less to do coming down, which would also make the swing look a little bit, <laughs> a little bit uh, aesthetically better. 
Um, well, I think, yeah, you'll see less flip and all those ideas. You know, when a player is a little bit stronger, a little bit more toward flexion, uh, they've already sort of preloaded impact to a certain extent. Yeah. Impact alignments here and here. So now they can just sort of focus on creating speed and, and creating whatever pathway to the golf ball they need to hit whether it's that little fade or little draw or whatever it happens to be. So I do think there is a trend there. I think you'll continue to see, let's say, the modern player be more toward flexion, a little bit stronger face as we continue to go along, simply because the ball launch is uh, quite a bit higher. Thanks for watching, everybody, the JRL Golf Academy. Please make sure to link and comment down below. Make sure you subscribe and turn on that little bell for notifications. And we look forward to seeing you on the next JRL Golf Academy.